What is almost universally recognized as the greatest empire of antiquity, the Roman Empire, traces its origins to one small and unassuming city-state, that city-state of course being named Rome. As a kingdom, it would go on to expand beyond its protective walls to dominate its immediate neighboring lands within the first two centuries of its existence. True growth, however, wouldn't begin until the rise of the Republic, which would proceed to conquer its neighbors along the western Italian coast over the course of another two centuries, coming to occupy nearly the entire peninsula just one century after that. From here, Rome's growth would collide with that of the Great Carthaginian Empire of North Africa, a powerful state with naval designs for the Italian islands of Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica. Refusing to be confined and dominated by this foreign power, the Romans would beat Carthage back and seize the islands for themselves. A rivalry had been formed and now each of their lands became fair game for the other. When Carthage made an ally of Macedonia and Greece, so too did that territory become of interest to Rome. Despite facing enemies to the south, east, and west, the Romans overcame the odds, capturing Hispania from Carthage, followed by Macedonia, before finally taking Carthage itself. The acquisition of these lands gave Rome new obligations, new threats and enemies to face upon these new frontiers, and so expansions continued, into Anatolia to secure Macedonia from rival Greek states, into North Africa to secure Carthage from the Numidians, and to Gaul so as to connect by land Roman Italia to Hispania, and into Dalmatia to do the same for Macedonia. Just one century later, Rome would hold dominion over all lands bordering the Mediterranean, including the whole of Hispania, the whole of Gaul, the entirety of Anatolia, the Mauritanian coast, and Egypt. The Republic had ceased to exist and from the ashes of a war-torn state emerged the Roman Empire. Rome owed much of its early success to the sheer might and robustness of its social order. Rome had been a strictly hierarchical state bound by thorough codified laws which deeply valued military might and piety, traits which are even seen attributed to their first kings. This type of youthful vigor is often felt by young states, but when paired with the sound discipline of a strict and reciprocal legal code, so there do the origins of greatness show themselves. It truly meant something to be a Roman citizen. With that title came a set of privileges, but said privileges demanded of the Roman that he uphold certain responsibilities, and from that a reciprocal relationship emerged between the citizen and the state, in which one enriched the other and a harmonious cycle began. For good reason, military law initially favored the high-born patricians, allegedly descendants of Rome's original senators under Romulus, who had received their positions based upon their demonstration of exceptional intelligence, combat skills, and general leadership abilities, traits which tended to reappear in their descendants. The patricians, having been wealthier and more successful, could afford to purchase better weapons and equipment, which in turn made them more favorable for combat, placing them on the front lines of battle. If they survived, their return home would earn them greater standing in the Republic, which potentially opened up for them a career in politics. That aside, war could prove quite lucrative if there was wealth to be looted from an enemy settlement, but for the average Roman of the time, honor and duty transcended this, as evidenced by the fact that in terms of money, the majority made little if anything at all from their military service during the age of the Republic. For those less wealthy, this proved a risky sacrifice as they could not afford to campaign very long without pay. Every day they spent in military service was an other day they could not farm, harvest, or otherwise work for themselves in any capacity. Some would even return home to financial ruination if a campaign happened to last longer than expected. Becoming landless, these individuals would join the fraction of the population excluded from military service as they were expected to be unable to provide for their own equipment, and it was assumed this break from the military would allow some time to recover. However, as this system persisted, the pool of conscripts grew smaller, allowing political power and wealth to be increasingly concentrated within the upper classes who could afford to continue fighting. It should also be mentioned that non-citizens serving the military for two and a half decades could achieve Roman citizenship not only for themselves but for their families as well, encouraging many to join for that opportunity alone. These non-citizens being sequestered away in their own military groupings, mind you. The troubles of this system became clear when the less wealthy plebs began refusing to participate in the social order by repeatedly abandoning their jobs, feeling as though they had been wronged and disenfranchised from the Roman order. The state seeking to remedy this granted the plebs greater power and securities, only for these privileges to be abused in the name of enriching the pleb class at the expense of Rome. In the upper classes, moral rot had begun as well. Military service increasingly became less a moral duty to preserve the whole of Rome, and more a means of self-enrichment. While some became overly ambitious and power-hungry, others of this class grew lazy and selfish from their accumulation of so much wealth and luxury, making them weak, comfortable, and unwilling to continue service beyond the bare minimum. Once the state began sponsoring the equipment of new recruits and providing direct financial incentive for enlistment in a permanent standing army, so did the lower classes flock to the military in numbers so high that conscription became more obsolete year by year. However, while Rome's lower ranks were filling up, the pool of competent and loyal officers remained small, the elites who comprised this pool opting to pursue a political career instead of passing their knowledge and experience down to newcomers, 
While those who did remain often became too close to their soldiers, this paired with the responsibility of generals to pay their soldiers made career officers potential threats of the state, as their soldiers often developed a closer loyalty to them than to the Roman government. Clearly, the cycle of reciprocity between the people and the state was disintegrating, with the military being one but perhaps the best demonstration of such. Across the board, morality and cooperation was on the decline. Corruption was rising, rebellions and power grabs became more frequent, debauchery was embraced at the expense of discipline, and as a result, both Rome's people and its government grew weaker. But the ultimate replacement of the Republic with the Empire and the dictatorships which preceded the transition sought to correct Rome's decline. At the time, blame was largely hoisted upon the uneducated pleb underclass, whose overwhelming numbers and rising political influence was seen as dragging Rome down. The dictatorship of Sulla sought to eradicate plebeian political power, and to restore it squarely to the patricians, but this was undone by another aspiring dictator who believed he could exploit plebeian desires, Neos Pompeius. Under Emperor Augustus, both senatorial and pleb power was suppressed and entrusted largely to the emperor. He sought to promote the growth of the patrician class, among whom were most of the empire's best and brightest, by passing laws which encouraged monogamous reproduction and penalized celibacy or promiscuity. At the same time, Augustus attempted to root out corruption and hold the patricians to a higher moral standard. Augustus's reforms did not neglect the plebs either, as while he remained skeptical of their abilities given their poor history and power, it was clear brilliant men still existed among the lower class, and such men should have the opportunity to ascend to a higher status while patricians of undeserving high status should be brought down in what has been deemed a meritocracy of virtue. Sadly, Augustus failed to secure Rome's political succession to the hands of men capable of ruling it, his two adoptive sons whom he had hoped to educate and raise as dual rulers, but who had died young. Instead, Tiberius was chosen, under whom corruption and greed emerged from within the government once again, particularly within the Praetorian Guard, the personal bodyguards of the emperor, who in later years assassinated and raised emperors as they saw fit, neutering the Roman government and breaking the social cycle once again, though attempts would be made to restore it a number of times. The ultimate result of this had been the emergence of an apathy among the Roman people for their government and state, leaving the country with a diminishing sense of unity and understandably so, as aside from previously mentioned social factors, Rome had become far larger than it had ever been, and wars hardly if ever threatened the Italian homeland directly, meaning there was less enthusiasm and investment from the Roman people in protecting their country for their own sake, and a greater false sense of security in the strength of the empire, not to mention a great underestimating of the empire's enemies. Without a sense of urgency to protect their own homeland, without a moral sense of duty to protect the empire, and with a dwindling sense of kinship brought on by the various new peoples and groups who had been annexed into the empire, warfare and national service became a purely self-enriching venture for the Italian Romans, Something to do to better your own lot, and not much more. That was the case for the Italian Romans, mind you. While Italia stood secure and its people grew soft and comfortable, the Romans living within the lands of Gaul, Pannonia, Dalmatia, and across the east, faced external dangers on a regular basis, and it is no coincidence that as the years wore on, while Italia provided fewer and fewer soldiers, recruitment in these other regions soared. Pannonia, Illyria, and Moesia becoming the new source of Rome's most capable officers, and the second largest source of emperors throughout all the empire's pre-Byzantine history, right behind Italia, and more than all the other remaining provinces combined. Eventually, Gaul and Illyria alone would be responsible for more than half of the West's total legionaries, but ultimately the weight of constant war, plagues, and economic crisis proved too much for these border regions, leading to a drop in their populations and desperate efforts to raise them. In the end, the drastic measure was taken to repopulate these borderlands with some of the very barbarians who threatened their existence. If the populations would not sustain themselves, then they would be replaced, with the hope that in small numbers and spread out over wide areas, assimilation might be achieved. And while some success was found, in time this move would ultimately deliver the killing blow to the Empire. Soon, Italian Romans made up but a fraction of the army, Romans in general but a slightly larger fraction, as the personal incentive to join the army that might have existed prior was utterly eliminated or made obsolete by the desperate state of the Roman economy. Barbarians now made up an overwhelming majority of the Roman army, some estimates claiming as much as 75% of total manpower. The separation of Roman and barbarian forces which existed prior was phased out, creating mixed regiments which at times struggled to cooperate or simply distrusted each other. Rome had essentially lost all influence it held over barbarian settlements, many maintaining their tribal governments, cultures, and languages, their loyalty to Rome being secured by little more than written agreements. It was only a matter of time before the outnumbered and outgunned Romans of the West saw their empire seized away from them, and so it had been, but not before Italia and the city of Rome itself was brought before the barbarian sword. Province after province was lost, and eventually so too was Italy leaving only a successor to Rome, the Byzantine Empire in the east, to carry on the torch of Roman civilization. 
But what if that changed? What if in an alternate timeline, Western Rome survived? Clearly, the root of Rome's troubles began long before the Empire had even taken form. To remedy these issues at their source might be sufficient to prevent Roman collapse and recession of territory entirely, but would ultimately produce something extremely distinct from the Rome we knew and leave too many new variables to realistically account for. Instead, we'll suppose that the Empire on the brink of its collapse takes steps in the right direction to undo the damage of the 3rd century crisis and various other troubles which culminated in the barbarian conquest of the West. Four noteworthy men and time periods immediately come to mind. Emperor Valentinian in the late 4th century, Magister Militum Stilicho in the early 5th century, Magister Militum Flavius Aetius in the mid-5th century, and Emperor Majorian shortly then after. Valentinian stood as Western Emperor alongside his brother Valens in the East. As Emperor he engaged in regular combat with the Germans and other barbarian groups, learning firsthand the need for strong defense along the border and the danger these groups posed to Rome. Valentinian had died of a stroke just as the Empire was about to face its greatest border crisis yet. The western advance of the Huns had driven various other tribes to flee the region and collide with the border of Rome. One of these tribes had been the Goths. They were allowed to settle within the Roman border by Emperor Valens, believing as many emperors of the time did that they could be assimilated and prove a useful supply of additional manpower. However, the Goths arrived in such overwhelming number that many of them weren't even properly disarmed upon entry. An almost immediate escalation of tension led to the Gothic War, which saw Rome essentially cede to the Goths an autonomous zone, in which they would continue to abide by their own laws, but remain bound to Rome by a military alliance. This outcome being perceived by many as a Roman victory, despite the fact that this would set a new and dangerous precedent for the Empire, who had previously kept its military allies outside the border of the Empire, or in the case of resettled barbarians, disarmed them, spread them apart, kept them under strict oversight, and held them to Roman cultural standards. That was not the case for the Goths, and quite soon other tribes would carve out their own portions of Rome. Valentinian, had he survived, would not have made the same decision his brother had, given his recognition of the Germans as dangerous and untrustworthy. In all likelihood, Valentinian would have only taken a small fraction of the Gothic population as refugees, or denied them entry altogether. If they retaliated at the border, Rome would at least be able to fight from a better defended position, and the Goths would be unlikely to fight as hard as they had in our timeline, as by being left outside of Rome, they would need to preserve their strength for when they inevitably faced the Huns. The abrupt death of Valentinian followed by the death of his brother Valens in the Gothic War had ultimately left Rome on course for one of the most dismal emperors the Empire had yet seen, Honorius. He is often described as an extremely apathetic ruler, one who sabotaged himself by executing his most effective and trusted general, prosecuting several skilled officials, and authorizing a massacre of barbarian civilians, turning the Empire's barbarian population wholly against the Roman government. In a world where both Valentinian and Valens survived, the reign of Honorius and the circumstances surrounding it simply don't exist, as Honorius' father, Theodosius, wouldn't have been appointed co-ruler by Valentinian's son upon Valens' death. Still, not all was lost even under Honorius. As we mentioned, Honorius was fortunate enough to have an extremely skilled general during his reign, Flavius Stilicho, a soldier of mixed Roman vandal background with a deep loyalty to the Empire, who succeeded in rallying behind him the support of various barbarians to serve under the Imperial banner, repelling various invasions and rebellions, that is, until the overwhelming crossing of the Rhine in 406. A coalition of barbarian tribes flooded into Roman territory, plundering through Gaul and invading Hispania. Silico had redirected as many of the Empire's troops as possible to deal with other more immediate threats in the east, which he had hoped to simply pay off so as to focus on combating the invading barbarians, but the Senate, being too proud to make such a concession, refused, leaving the barbarians to continue their rampage. Honorius, being led to believe that this was an intentional betrayal orchestrated by Stilicho, had him executed and the families of his barbarian soldiers killed, leading them to defect against the Emperor in pursuit of revenge. The Western Empire was now defenseless and besieged by enemies in all its provinces. The city of Rome, for the first time in centuries, would be sacked by invading barbarians, leaving even the most sheltered Roman to realize how far their civilization had fallen. In the years immediately following, various barbarian tribes would set up permanent residence within the Roman Empire. The Vandals, the Alans, the Swabi, the Burgundians, not to mention the already present Franks and Visigoths. Had Stilicho survived and been allowed to make peace with the Goths, there is no guarantee but a chance that the West could have been saved. The invading barbarians either driven out or brought to a more favorable negotiation thanks to Stilicho's own barbarian heritage and history of keeping them in check. In many ways, Stilicho was a bridge between these two worlds and a model for what the barbarians could become and achieve if they assimilated. We might even imagine a best case scenario in which upon Anorius's death, he or the Eastern Roman Empire named Stilicho a successor, signaling to the West a new Roman-Germanic duality within the Empire, much like the Greco-Roman duality of the East. 
Even if this best possible outcome didn't occur, Stilicho would have at the very least bought the West some additional time to recover, rebuild its armies, and retake its lost land gradually over the course of decades, though even this seems like wishful thinking. While Rome was certainly battered by the attack on its historic capital, it wasn't lost yet. Rome still possessed at its disposal provinces which could supply capable soldiers, a bountiful source of food to sustain and grow a large population, and of course the heartland and brain of the empire, which continued to provide a supply of well-educated politicians. That said, times were harder than they had ever been, and these provinces didn't produce with the same quantity and quality that they once had. But among the lazy elites and cowardly masses were still geniuses and warriors, and sometimes fate would deliver both in the form of a single man. That man, for this time, would be Flavius Aetius, a general like Stilicho, also of partial barbarian ancestry. At age 14, Aetius had been made a hostage to the barbarians, initially the Goths and later the Huns, remaining with them for years and enduring their harsher lifestyles, before ultimately returning to Rome, becoming commander-in-chief of the Roman army in Gaul, where he would contend with the barbarians while also balancing his position as part of a new military triumvirate between himself and two other commanders in Italy and Africa eventually eliminating his rivals and securing his place as Rome's leading commander, though at the cost of losing North Africa to the Vandals. The ascension of Attila as the new Hunnish king saw the Huns turn their attention to Gaul, which was not only a Roman territory but land occupied by multiple barbarian tribes. Aetius, using this common enemy as a pretext, managed to rally behind him a coalition of previously warring barbarians and repel the Hunnish invasion. Before he could do more to save the crumbling empire, Aetius was assassinated by the emperor himself, who saw Aetius as a potential usurper and threat to his power. With Aetius gone, Rome was left vulnerable once again, and the Vandals, sensing this weakness, proceeded to sack the city of Rome once again. Had Aetius survived, the opposite may very well have happened. The loss of North Africa had cost Rome a major food and revenue source. With it gone, imperial level strength could not be sustained much longer, making it far more valuable than the lost provinces of Gaul and Hispania, which Aetius did intend on reintegrating with time, though whether or not he would have that time is debatable, as he would have been in his 60s by this point. Even with the surrounding provinces lost and with the death of Rome's greatest general in years, there was still a small glimmer of hope for the empire. For so long as Roman men occupied Italia and the will to fight remained, there was no land lost that could not be regained. The one man whose will stood strongest above all others was a general and emperor alike, Julius Valerius Majorian, the last western emperor to effectively fight for Rome's salvation. Under Majorian, significant campaigns were undertaken to retake Gaul, push back the barbarians in Hispania, and ultimately reclaim North Africa. He'd succeed in repelling barbarian expansion, subduing the Burgundians within Gaul and the Visigoths and the Swabian Hispania, driving them to the very borders of their provinces and placing them under federated status. He had cleared a path for an invasion of North Africa with a recently expanded fleet, only to have it destroyed by traitorous Romans paid off by the North African Vandals. He'd be once again betrayed soon after by disgruntled politicians and political rivals, stripped of his imperial authority, and killed. Rome would never recover following his death, but this time, things are different. In a world where Majorian successfully set sail for North Africa and survived the attempts made on his life, he would have almost certainly brought about a new period of stability for the Western Empire. Majorian's planned campaign in Africa was said to be more meticulously planned than any which had preceded it, given the greater significance of the region to Rome's recovery. Vandal tactics and capabilities were said to have been studied extensively, to the point that it's even alleged Majorian personally investigated the Vandal army while disguised as a Roman diplomat. Every effort was made by the Vandals to prevent Majorian from reaching their territorial heartland, including the destruction of their own lands in Mauritania to deprive the Romans of any resources before they even landed, signaling that the Vandals recognized Majorian's capabilities and high likelihood of retaking North Africa. Upon the conquest of this land, the Vandals, unlike other barbarians Majorian had conquered, may be eradicated entirely or expelled deeper into the African continent as revenge for their sacking of Rome. Once this was done, Majorian would return to Rome to continue the political reforms he had already begun implementing to restore the empire's stability and growth. In our world, Majorian had implemented new moral and economic codes to whip the bloated upper class back into shape, while at the same time promoting marriage and childbearing to rebuild Rome's falling population, much like Augustus had. Despite the enemies who had betrayed him in our timeline, Majorian is described as being a very effective politician and negotiator, being well respected by much of the senatorial upper class and having their support in the majority of his policies. This level of cooperation again suggests that if Majorian were to overcome the initial hurdles challenging his place as emperor, he would be able to set the empire back on track, rebuilding Rome's presence in North Africa, Hispania, and Southern Gaul, preventing the ultimate conquest and breakup of the West. A Rome which survived these challenges would remain a united megastate, with well-defined borders that may expand or recede over the centuries, but ultimately preserve the essence of what was this West Mediterranean Empire.
a self-sufficient entity who could exist in alternating friendship and rivalry with the Eastern Empire, as well as with the barbarian kingdoms north of its borders, some of whom may be annexed over time, or who may annex additional bits of Roman territory themselves. The US of Z thanks you for watching, support your legion by liking the video, or join our ranks by subscribing for more. Mr. Z.